this morning. Uh, we dealt with the introduction last week. We discussed uh, what the book is generally about, who wrote the book, and about when it was written. Now we're going to get into why I consider this book to be a rather difficult book. Not that it is impossible to understand, because it is very possible to understand. However, we actually have to sit down and determine that we are going to let it speak rather than the, the whether it's just what I say about it or whether it's anyone else who says about it. There's a lot of false doctrine is taught from this book. And so we're going to begin with the historical purpose of the book of Romans. And thus far in our studies through the Bible, we started all the way back in Genesis. We finished the Old Testament through Malachi. And thus far in this book, we've gone from Matthew to Acts. We've been dealing a lot with narratives. Even in the books of prophecy, you can, be, you can see narrative play through a lot, of, at least some of those books. In the epistles, we're going to get very little narrative. It's the, the epistles are books of teaching. They're letters that uh, teach Christians how to live their lives, how to uh, become a Christian in the beginning, uh, what God expects of Christians uh, in when it comes to their worship, when it comes to how we treat our neighbors, when it comes to how we spread the gospel, when it comes to what we should be believing. Uh, and so when it comes to this section, you have to come along and say, well, how... Uh, this section usually deals with uh, how does this book can be placed into history? And what gives this book context? And we're not really going to get that uh, from a narrative. But there is a lot of things that uh, can be talked about from a historical point of view. And so instead of looking at how does this book relate to and place itself into history, what we're going to be asking in this specific book is how is God's plan laid out through history and Paul revealing it to us in the book of Romans. So if we could, we can go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, our first question, uh, which is question 3 in the book, is how does Paul's statement concerning the gospel of Christ set forth the, set forth the theme of this book? Let's go to Romans 1, the word can get verses 16 and 17. Yes, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right, so we're going to answer this question. How does Paul's statement concerning the gospel set forth the theme of this book? From this passage, what do we learn? The power of salvation. What is the power of salvation? The gospel. The gospel is the power of salvation. How is that true? It's a statement. It's a true statement. How is that true? Because when you teach the gospel, you teach baptism, you teach everything that leads to salvation. Okay. When, when um, Philip met up with the Ethiopian dude, what did he teach? Right? The gospel. Yeah, the gospel of Jesus Christ, too. Like, as far as we, we have to be specific, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I know you were. Um, it's important that we realize I don't save anybody, and neither do you. The gospel of Christ saves people. If we aren't converted to Christ, we haven't been converted at all. If you became a Christian because of the, my preaching, and you just love my preaching, 
but it's based on my preaching, not based on the gospel, then you've been converted to me. And if I were to leave, then you might come along and not like the preacher that comes after me. You may like him better, I don't know. Wasn't that addressed in the first Corinthians? I am yeah. Paul. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Paul yeah. Was, yeah, it was. Is Christ and, divided? Yeah, exactly. And we're going to get to that more when we get to the next book, which is First Corinthians. But that's a good point to make. We are not converted to preachers. We are converted to the gospel of Christ. In it is the power of salvation. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians as well when it comes to through the foolishness of the message preached. God chose to save mankind. To those who don't believe, it is foolishness. But to those who do believe, it is the power of God. It shows us how to be saved. And so when someone comes along and says, well, we shouldn't, like as far as I'm saved by Jesus, I'm not saved by gospel. That's the problem. Because the gospel is what reveals Jesus to us. We can't, we, we, we would know very little about Jesus if not for the Bible. There are a lot of people who don't believe Jesus exists at all. They think the Bible, the writers of the Bible, they made him up. Or at least they exaggerated him. We know very little about Jesus if it wasn't for the gospel. And so we are saved by the gospel of Christ. Callie, you had something? Well, I always go back to the scripture because <clears throat> this is how the word of God is designed to do, which is the gospel. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as dividing of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. Mm -hmm. That's what it's designed to do. Yeah. So the gospel will do one of two things. It will always do one of two things. It will either bring someone closer to God or it will drive them away. And we come along, we don't like it when the gospel drives people away. Because we want to see people saved. It's God's will to draw people to himself. However, some people don't want to be drawn. Have you ever seen a child? Sometimes, like as far as you want, you want a child to do something, sometimes the child will eagerly do it because they want to do it. Other times you have to almost drag them kicking and screaming. Well, God will not do that for us. If we do not want to follow him, he will allow us to do that. There are consequences for that. But he will allow us to blind ourselves, to remain lost, and to suffer the consequences for that. How can a loving God do that? Because he has provided us the way out. He has provided us the way to be saved. That's how a loving God can justly punish those who don't obey is because he provides everyone the same opportunity. If we are in hell, it is not God's fault. It is our own fault. And nobody else's. I can't blame the devil. I can't blame my neighbor. I can't blame my parents or my children. I can't blame other Christians. I can't blame God. Only one to blame for not obeying God is me. And so we have the gospel. Verse 17, though, says how we are saved by the gospel. Someone say something? Mm -hmm. Boy. Yes, it's, um, if you have faith in the gospel, if you believe, you have to believe. And the faith that drives you to do his will. The gospel's power, like as far as the gospel has the power, but the gospel alone, if it's just words on a page, that's not going to save me. I can read the Bible. I can read it from cover to cover and not do a thing with it. That doesn't make the gospel powerless. It just means that I didn't believe it. Atheists claim to have read the Bible, and some of them do. Some of them know it better than some Christians. They don't believe it, but a lot of them have read it. 
In fact, I think one person, I forget, I forget exactly who, we probably borrowed it from someone, said if someone actually read the Bible from cover to cover, they wouldn't be a Christian. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 1 talks about. It's foolishness to those who don't believe. It's absolute foolishness and nonsense. But those who do believe it is the power of God. The gospel will draw or not, but we have to believe in the gospel. We have to have faith in the gospel. Uh, um, James. And uh, as it becomes James said, in chapter 2, the devil knows who is the Bible. Yeah. He knows every word in it. Yeah, but he just doesn't want to be back there. Yeah. I guess the, the devil knows he was quoting scripture to Jesus. He quoted scripture to Jesus during his temptations. And he quoted it correctly. He was misusing it, but he quoted it. And, and so just because someone quotes scripture doesn't mean A, they're using it correctly, and doesn't mean A, B, that they believe it or are acting upon it. Now, we need to be careful. When it comes along and talks about everyone who believes. We've talked about this before. And if you're listening to our podcast in the book of John, we're talking about it there consistently because the book of John covers that as well. Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 5, Romans 8, uh, other, other chapters in Romans are used to teach the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. And people like to grab on to verse 16 and says, well, everyone who believes, I believe in Jesus, therefore, I am saved. But what does that belief cause you to do? Is that just uh, nothing? Yeah. It's an act of faith. Yes, it's an act of faith. And Romans, if you read the book of Romans, affirms that too. Uh, the book of Romans doesn't tell Christians that... All you have to do is just acknowledge Jesus as your Savior. Do you ever hear that? Do you ever see, well, you just need to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Well, you need to accept the message of Jesus, but that means you accept all of what he says. You don't, it's not just a mental thing where, okay, Jesus, come into my soul and save my soul from hell. Believing in Jesus, yes. Believing that Jesus can do that, yes. But Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. If you accept Jesus, you will do what he says. Jesus said in Luke, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It's that important that we do all of what Jesus said. The righteousness of God is revealed to us. And Paul quotes in verse 17, the book of, uh, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. Those who have been justified by God will live by faith. They will do what he says. And when we find out we're not doing what he says, we will repent and ask God to forgive us if we're Christians. And if we're not Christians, we'll do what God said to begin with and become Christians. If we are going to be justified in Christ, it's going to be by faith, but not by faith alone. And so Paul is going to deal with this topic of justification in this book. And he's going to start, and I don't want to take too much from the content, which will be later. He's going to start by having to tell people you have a problem. It has been told that psychologists will tell you and, and self-help people will tell you, you can't fix the problem until you admit you have one. Because if you don't know you have a problem, why are you going to go out and fix it? So the question, why do I need to be saved by Jesus? What's our problem? We have a sin problem. We have a sin problem. Romans is going to deal with the, the, the correct notion that I can't earn my way to heaven. 
I can't do enough good works to balance out all of the sin I committed. If you had a scale and you put sin on one side and good works on the other, guess what? Sin is going to be weighing down that and any good work is not going to move the scale one inch. Not one inch. You can pile on all the good works you want. Sin will weigh it down. Just one sin. Can you imagine piling other sins on top of it? Uh, it is that weight that cannot be moved just by obedience. Now, you add faith in Christ and the blood of Christ, and now the, the sin, it won't be balanced out. The sin will be removed. And just like if you're a kid on a teeter-totter and the person at the top tries and just goes and jumps off, what will happen when that happens to the kid who's on the bottom of that teeter-totter? They'll fly up. Like as far as, yeah. yeah sorry, I, I usually do it the other way. So if the person on the bottom jumps off, person who's up in the air will crash down. That's exactly what will happen. Well, what happens when the blood of Christ forgives our sins through faith? The sin is gone. It's not that the blood of Christ balances out sin. It doesn't. It removes it. The weight is gone. You have now been justified. But first you have to realize you have a problem. And there are two sets of people that Paul addresses in the first few chapters. He's first of all got to address the Gentiles. And he does that in chapter 1 and really chapter 3. He's got to tell the Gentiles, you left God and uh, in chapter 1 and went off and served idols. They're looking at you. No, no, we're, gonna, we're talking about the Gentiles first. The Gentiles abandoned God in chapter 1, and God let them walk away. If we are in wrath in chapter 1, let's, re, let's step down and read verse 18 and onwards. I'll, I'll read this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the eternal, or by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing them to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made of corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All mankind does this. Let's not come along and, and say, well, we didn't do that, and therefore we're better. Not the Jews had that problem. And Paul had to address that too. But the Gentiles largely left God. You know, that's why we don't read a lot of their history in the Old Testament. We get glimpses here and there. Jonah is sent to the people of Nineveh. They're Gentiles. They're not Jews. And he preached repentance. And the people of Nineveh repented. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he knew about God. Uh, he had dealings with the true God of heaven. And he believed. Whether or not he's saved, that's up to God. But he believed in God uh, because it was unmistakable. But when we read of most of the Gentiles in the Old Testament, the reason why they didn't, uh, they, they, most of them aren't going to be saved is not because they weren't under the law of Moses. That's what the Jews thought. And that's a mistake we can make. They aren't saved because they didn't have faith in God. They did not do what God told them to do. They went off and served idols. And so they can't be accepted in that. The Jews, however, had a different thought. The Jews thought they could be justified by their law, the law of Moses. And, and so they, they had come along and said, well, we don't need Jesus because we have Moses. We have animal sacrifices. The priests, so like as far as we go to the tabernacle or the temple at that time, 
and we offer uh, blood of the bulls and the goats, day of atonement. You have the scapegoat, takes the sins off into the wilderness. And the Jews thought, well, if, if I just do the law of Moses, if I just perform the law of Moses, I can be saved by the law of Moses. And they're wrong. Why? All right, it was the schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. That's true, that's Galatians. But why couldn't the law, why couldn't just obedience to the law of Moses save them? Okay, all right, we have, we have salvation by works here, and that would be trying to earn our salvation. There's another problem, it's a foundational problem. The blood of bulls and goats cannot save you. Sin problem. That's the problem. Sin problem. I break the law of Moses. Paul is going to say, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And the blood of a bull and a goat won't remove sins. And so the law of Moses, while it is a good law, while it is a just law, reveals sin to us. It revealed sin and could do nothing about it. When we come to the law of Christ, that's a conclusion people come along from Romans 2 and Romans 3, and they... And say, so see here, today we're under grace. We're not under law. And, and because we're under grace, we really don't have to follow the law. Because, after all, the law brings death. And that's where remembering that the law, almost exclusively in Romans, is talking about the law of Moses. The law of Christ, which still has to be obeyed in faith, can't be just done blindly, just, just doing the motions. Coming to worship on Sunday, oh, that's my that's my Christianity for the week. I'm going to go off and live the way I want to the other six days, six and a half days a week, and never never give God another thought. I come to church on Sunday, I give to the church, and that's salvation by works alone, and that's not going to save us. But the, but the blood of Christ fixes the sin problem. Why is a lot of the law of Moses repeated in the law of Christ? Because those are all-encompassing laws. Murder has always been sinful. Stealing has always been sinful. Coveting uh, our neighbor's wife or our neighbor's goods always been sinful. Lying has always been sinful. Dishonoring parents always sinful. Those are universal laws. But when we break the law now, if we're a Christian, there is a way out. If we're a non-Christian, there is a way out. And it is through the blood of Christ. We have to obey God in faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We are not saved by works alone. We are not saved by faith alone. We are not saved by grace alone. We are saved by it. Faith without works is dead. We are saved by grace through faith. Those are all statements that are true in the New Testament. We're saved by the blood of Christ. We're saved by hope. We're saved by God. All of those things. You can't come along and say, well, which one's more important? Without one, they're all useless. You've got to come along and have it all. Let's stop trying to compartmentalize everything and just accept what the scriptures say and do what God says. And so the sin problem with the Gentiles, and the sin problem with the Jews leads us to Romans 3, 23, which says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why there is only one way to salvation. That's why there's not one way for the Gentiles who sin this way and one way for the Jews who sin this way. No, all sin. Jesus, the only solution, only way to heaven. You gotta come and obey Jesus in faith. And that's what Paul is saying. God had this plan all along. Let's not come along and think, well, Moses, that was God's first plan, and that failed, so God came over and made this plan. James said earlier that the law of Moses was a schoolmaster to bring the Jews to Christ because it would show them their sinfulness it would show them their need for God. And it pointed them to the Messiah. 
who would come and take the sins away. John said in John 1, John the Baptist said in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what the Jews should have been looking for. The Gentiles weren't looking for that because they had gone off and served idols. Yet when many heard that news, they realized the truth in it and they obeyed Christ. Not every Gentile did. Not even the majority of the Gentiles did. Let's not come along and kid ourselves and say, well, the Gentiles, they, they were so much better than the Jews. They weren't. Everyone needs Christ. Everyone can be saved the same way through faith and obedience to Christ. And so, really the first, you could say the first 10, 11 chapters are dealing with justification by faith. How did God do it? <clears throat> but you got to start with the prophet. Then chapter 5 through chapter 9 and 10 deals with the solution. We were reconciled to, to God through Christ and his shed blood. Having been reconciled, we can now be in fellowship with God, but we aren't to live in sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. Do you not know as, uh, that you were, when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death? We were baptized, when being buried with him in baptism, we were raised to walk, not in our old lives, in newness of life. We should see a difference in our lives. Will it be perfect? No. But there should be a difference. We should think differently, talk differently, act differently. We will realize when we haven't. Our conscience will convict us of things that it didn't convict us of before because we had seared it. And so Paul deals with, here's the problem, here's the solution, and the end of the book, now what? Now what do you do with that? Let's go to Romans 12. We'll come to Cala. I'm going to split this up a little bit. Romans chapter 12. Uh, Callie, you want to get verses 1 and 2. Christina, do you want to get 3 and 4? John, 5 and 6. And James, 7 and 8. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Now verse 5 and 6, John. So we who are many are of one body in Christ, individually members one of others, since we have given a different accounting to the grace given to us, each of us is to Christ that accordingly the prophecy according to the vision of this place. God ministers, let us wait on our ministering. Father, are we that teachers and teachers? Are we that exhorters and exhortations? He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, uh, we'll come up to uh, Annie. Annie, you want to get 9 and 10? And that, 11 and 12. Mister, do you want to read? Sure. Uh, you can get verses 13 and 14. We'll come back to Gord, 15 and 16. Calla, 17 and 18. And then Christina can finish off the chapter in 19 to 21. Now, 
Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, because the same be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Never favor up evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a tough chapter. Yeah. It is not easy to it is easy to read them no one had difficulty reading those statements it's a difficult chapter because when we renew our minds when we become christians now we have to go out and do what god wants present your bodies a living sacrifice under the old law they offered sacrifices to god not of their bodies of somebody else's of an animal's body to live, you, you want to talk about spiritual sacrifices? It is what we do, living sacrifices. But they're not just any old sacrifice. Remember, blood, uh, animals offered had to be without spot and blameless. Well, in, uh, without, yeah, or, uh, without I, I, blemish. I've never seen a lamb blameless. Yeah, it's, it, you're right, you're right. Uh, well, it depends, it depends how you use the word blame. I guess the King James would use it a little differently, but you're right. In today's language, yes. With, uh, without spot or blemish. Uh, and so the word in the New Testament that you would call that is holy. Holy is without blemish. Holy, acceptable to God, which is not just your grudging service. It's a reasonable service. It is not something that is impossible to do. It is reasonable. Do not be conformed to this world. That's hard. We get, we get, uh, you can go on the internet and just read terrible things. You can go onto the television, just read or listen and watch terrible things. And you can just blend into society. If our lives just blend in and we just go along, well, it's okay, I'm under grace. A little sin's not going to matter. That's not what God said. A little leaven, leaven the whole lump. You're right. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't mold yourself after this world. That's what you did in the past. That's what got you into the problem. Instead of molding yourself to the world, transform your life. Now, that's not done on our own. That's done through the grace and gospel of God. We can transform. So instead of molding, we take the, our life, we extract it from the world. And now in, we would have, if, if you mold something, if you have the shape of the, of the image that you molded against. You can't come along and keep the shape. You've got to transform it. It's now got to look like Christ. And how does that happen? Well, uh, the rest of the chapter deals with that. There are spiritual gifts here. We've got to be careful. Other books in the New Testament are going to talk about miraculous spiritual gifts that have ceased, but they hadn't when the book of Romans was written. But a lot of the things that we do can still be done today uh, when it comes to verses 6 through 8. Whatever God has given us to do, let's do it. Let's be active in the church. Let's be active in our service to God. Let love be without hypocrisy. 
abhor what is evil, cling to that which is good. And of course, we only know that which is good from the gospel. Care for the needs of others. Uh, and to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't hate them. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind with one another. Keep your mind on high things. Associate not with the proud, but with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. In other words, always be willing to conform your mind to Christ. Admit you can be wrong. And if you are shown to be wrong, you repent and conform your ways to Christ. Live peaceably as it is possible. Sometimes it is not possible. Sometimes sin uh, will tell us, people who sin will tell us, you just need to live peaceably with me. I cannot do that. But I am to try in every way that I can. And don't seek vengeance. Allow God to repay evil for evil. We're not to seek vengeance. So we had a problem in the beginning of Romans. We had the solution in Christ. Now what? Live like a Christian. Actually go out and do what God wants you to do. You need to submit to government. You need to respect your brethren. And you need to go out and teach the gospel. And we need to send people to do that. And so... That is the historical purpose of Romans. That takes us all the way from the beginning all the way to now. Not only the writing of the book of Romans, but even to today. We have the same problems, we have the same solutions, and we have the same actions. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor